We think that we hit the peak of community transmission in British Columbia probably this past weekend. Optimism and caution for COVID in BC. Cases appear to be dropping, but hospitalizations may still rise. Also, there's never been price increase like this. There's never been delivery times like this. I've been here 44 years. I've never seen anything like it. So far, so slow. The cost and wait time for new furniture hits BC customers and businesses hard. And for the birds, a BC teenager's photographs hit the big time. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Anita is away tonight. There is optimism and caution in BC's fight against COVID-19 tonight. Health officials say transmission of the Omicron variant appears to be falling. BC's latest modeling report shows a drop in the case count similar to other parts of the world. But as John Hernandez explains, there are still concerns about more people ending up in hospital in the coming days. The fifth wave of COVID-19 in BC may have broken. But we can now say with some confidence that the pattern shows a, a, a sustained decrease. Health officials say latest coronavirus data shows a drop in the number of positive PCR tests province-wide, especially in the Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health authorities. So we think that we hit the peak of community transmission in British Columbia probably this past weekend. That's important. Um, there's a number of different indicators that allow us to say that with some certainty. While testing in BC has been at max capacity, the decline in positive cases correlates with amounts of the virus detected in BC's wastewater. Officials say the province is in a similar path as other jurisdictions that are also on the other side of the wave. But we're not out of the woods yet. Hospitalizations are expected to peak next week. Once you see the peak of transmission in the community, there's a lag of about a week before you see the peak of new admissions to hospital. And then there's a lag of about another week before we start to see a decrease in hospital census. A hospitalization apex right around the same time health officials will be reviewing current restrictions. Closures of gyms and bars remain in place until at least next week and an extension isn't out of the question. And we are in the process of looking at what is it that we need to do and what can we do uh, to change these things and, and um, look at the restrictions that are in place and are they needed anymore. Because when we allow cracks in our defences, COVID-19 will exploit those gaps. A cautious approach with light at the end of the tunnel. Reportedly milder cases in hospital align with Henry's claim that we just might be transitioning into an endemic. But getting there will still take weeks and months of work. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. The CBC's Justin McElroy joins us now live in studio to look more at hospitalizations and what those numbers mean for our overall health care system. Justin, what is the province looking at when it comes to turning the corner on the number of people who are hospitalized right now? Uh, the big question is when the daily number of new people going to hospital having COVID starts to drop because we know that hospitalizations are a lagging indicator for overall transmission. And if you take a look at this chart, over the past uh, two weeks or so, the number of daily people has been going up and up. Before Omicron came in, it was about 10 to 20 people a day. It's gone up to 40 to 60. Now you can see the last three days over 100 each day. So we're not seeing that peaking yet, but the province does believe that that should go down sometime in the next two weeks or so and stay at about that 100 person level for a bit. And why is this causing strain? Well, not only are numbers going up, but in terms of the number of healthcare workers that are reporting ill, it's extremely high right now. You look, these are the numbers for last week, not this week. Uh, and it's over 4,000 people in Coastal and Fraser, over 3,000 people in the interior and the island. It's a lot of strain right now, and it's causing a lot of issues at a lot of hos hospitals. But if you look at those other metrics that John mentioned, like wastewater, like the positivity rate, the province is hoping those hospital numbers in turn start to go down sooner rather than later. Now, concerning with the amount of people in healthcare who are not working, in this data though, do you see any silver linings for our province? Well, it's the one that people have been talking about for Omicron in jurisdictions around the world, and that is your chance of having a serious health outcome where you have to go to critical care 
if you get COVID is much lower. And we can take a look at that from this board right here. It's one we've shown before. The blue line is the number of people in ICU. That's just at about 100 right now. And you can see that's gone up just a little bit over the past couple weeks. But compared to overall hospitalizations and the rolling average, it's much less. So the province going to keep looking on that, hoping that stays low, hoping that hospitalizations crest over the next couple weeks. It's a lot of ifs at this point, but it's something that they're fairly confident on. We'll see what the numbers hold. Justin McElroy, thank you very much. Now, as we've heard, the parameters for hospitalizations in BC have now changed. Today, BC is reporting 646 COVID positive patients in hospital. 95 of them are in intensive care, and nearly half have not received a single vaccine dose. Six more people have died from the disease in the last 24 hours in BC. And yet again, today saw a new record high of third doses administered. Almost 60,000 people received boosters yesterday. But health officials say about 53,000 British Columbians aged 70 and older have received an invite for a booster but have not yet booked an appointment. That's despite cases climbing in that age group. Canada's men's soccer team has suffered a big setback. Star player Alfonso Davies is expected to miss three upcoming World Cup qualifiers after a bout with COVID, the star forward has been diagnosed with a health complication. The former Whitecap now plays in Germany with Bayern Munich. That club says he was diagnosed with mild myocarditis. In most cases, the illness is temporary. Davies, who grew up in Edmonton, will be out for a few weeks. Tough news for the national men's team, now confirming he will miss the next three games. They start in two weeks against Honduras, the U.S., and El Salvador. Across this country, COVID vaccination and booster rates are relatively high. But even people who have their shots are still getting sick. That is, some people asking, what's the point? And questioning the value of the booster. Or Vicodopia explains why it is vital to get that third shot. Even though Linda Lux had her booster, she says she still did everything she could to protect herself. Then the cold and flu-like symptoms started. And then the aches got worse, got the body aches, the skin aches, and that was over about a 24-hour maybe 36 hour period, and then it started to get better. Lux volunteers at a vaccination clinic and knew the booster wouldn't make her immune to the coronavirus. What caught me off guard was not so much catching it, but how quickly it, it came to my world when I'm very conscious of, of being safe. Indeed, the Omicron variant continues to spread like wildfire. And even though more Canadians have their boosters, the vaccinated are increasingly testing positive for COVID, which can seem as though boosters aren't working against Omicron. But consider how many Canadians had their shots. It's unvaccinated people still most at risk of infection and filling ICUs. Experts say boosters help shore up our antibody response to Omicron as well as our T-cells, but it's not perfect. They may not prevent you from being infected in the first place, but they will rapidly clear that infection before it can make you very sick in many people. And they'll also uh, reduce the amount of virus that you're, that you're generating um, and make it less likely that you will infect somebody else. With so many boosted people reporting cold-like symptoms, is it worth deliberately getting infected to get it over with? Experts say no. So natural immunity is not always better because it's not predictable. That's the problem. It's not predictable whether you'll be the person who has a profound immune response that can lead to complications um, like hospitalization, like long COVID. Not to mention the risk of infecting others who could still have severe outcomes. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. If you've tried to buy a piece of furniture recently, you may have been shocked at the price. Or maybe you're among many who've ordered something and are still waiting for it to arrive. It's because BC manufacturers and sellers are again being hit hard by supply chain issues and higher material costs. And as Isabel Regem shows us, the hit to the wallet is expected to get worse. Keeping up with changing trends, that goes hand in hand with working in the furniture business. But what the industry is dealing with right now, that's a first. 
There's never been price increase like this. There's never been delivery times like this. In my, I've been here 44 years. I've never seen anything like it. Essentially, every raw material used to make a sofa at Stylus's manufacturing factory is more expensive. Plastic to wrap furniture, cardboard, uh, any steel product. So the springs that go into a sofa, uh, that has all gone up about 30% over the last year. We have another price increase coming next month of 18%. Just last month, furniture giant IKEA warned its prices will increase an average of 9% globally in 2022, blaming significant transport and raw material constraints driving up costs. These price increases that are starting to show up um, because of the tariffs mainly and, and other supply chain issues as well. The co-founder of Urban Barn also points to temporary production shutdowns and a surge in demand for new furniture when Canadians started working from home in early 2020. While customers may only see a 10 to 15 percent increase in prices right now, he expects that will increase. Those prices are going to continue to rise just because furniture companies will no longer sit on this, um, the, the price uh, increase to them uh, without passing it on to the consumer. And as a result, more people may turn to used furniture. So, you know, as the price differential moves, we might see a, a more um, demand for the price saving that might come from a decently preserved secondhand piece. At Stylus, mounting costs and delays have led to six price increases for customers just in the last year. Just to try to keep up. With more likely to come, Isabel Regam, CBC News, Burnaby. Vancouver Police have a warning for you about what they're calling a troubling and brazen new scam targeting seniors. They claim fraudsters are showing up at people's doors to collect cash. Hi there, it's Chris from the courthouse. I'm uh, just picking up a package. The VPD is sharing this video to show how they say scammers are tricking people into believing their loved ones are in jail and need money to pay for legal costs like bail. The surveillance footage is from the home of a West Side couple in their 70s. They got a call from a man claiming their nephew was in a car wreck, ended up behind bars, and needed $8,000 for his legal fees. Then a person arrives at the door to collect those thousands of dollars in cash. That same day, police say a 75-year-old woman in Kitsilano was also cheated out of 9,000. Police don't know if this person is acting alone or part of a larger crime ring, but they are worried about people's safety. We are um, asking everyone to be cautious. We are asking people to speak to the elderly people in their lives, whether it's your grandparents, friends, parents. Um, if they get any types of calls like this, hang up. Uh, call us, let us know, especially if there's like a call display. But I think the first and foremost, we need to uh, inform those uh, people in our lives who we care about to try to prevent any more victims from this. She says similar crimes have been reported in other cities. The VPD's financial crime unit is now involved. People who have been living at an encampment in downtown Vancouver's Crab Park will get to stay. This after a Supreme Court judge denied the Vancouver Park Board's request to kick them out. The judge suspended two orders that would have forced dozens of people to leave their shelters. Two camp residents petitioned the Supreme Court for a judicial review, arguing the evic evictions unreasonably assumed campers would be able to find suitable indoor shelter elsewhere. The judge agreed. The legal team that backed us up and did this is, you know, they, they deserve a huge applause and thanks for all this. And it's just a wonderful thing and it's a good day. We're very thankful and really overwhelmed, as Clint said, by the de that decision to not do that and to allow people to stay in community. In his ruling, the judge also found residents were not given adequate notice or an opportunity to be heard before the eviction orders came down. A plan to ban older trucks, or older, trucks older than 10 years from Vancouver Parts ports starting February is now being postponed for now. The Port of Vancouver took action to try to cut emissions by as much as 93%. New trucks emit much less, and some of the fleet serving the port is more than 20 years old. Some truckers, though, have pushed back, saying they aren't able to upgrade due to high costs and the limited availability of new trucks. The port still plans to implement the ban, but a new date is expected in the coming days. Since the onset of the pandemic, the physiotherapy industry has been mired 
and licensing issues. National clinical exams have been canceled numerous times, putting the careers of graduates on hold. Now those exams will no longer be offered. As Jill Ballard reports, that leaves the industry without a national licensing test. So you're just going to straighten out your arms. Physiotherapy graduates have been waiting months, some almost years, to take the in-person component of their licensing exam. Earlier this week, the Canadian Alliance of Physiotherapy Regulators announced it would no longer be offered. It feels like the wait I've been holding around the past 15, 16 months has just been worthless. Over the last two years, the clinical examination process has been an endless saga of failures and technical glitches. And it's just exhausting to have to consistently fight uh, and just feel like our voices haven't been heard. Uh, it just sucks. Graduates, professionals and associations have long called for the cancellation of the clinical exam requirement altogether. Now, just because the Canadian Alliance of Physiotherapy Regulators has nixed its clinical component, that doesn't mean the exam is no longer required. In BC, the local college bylaws require that a candidate complete a competency exam in order to become a full member. We're in a worse off position than we were before right now because there is no united national exam. So every province is to themselves. Local colleges now must figure out whether they alter their bylaws or offer their own exams. And what we need addressed pretty um, immediately is getting um, those candidates that have been waiting up to two years and more um, moving forward. She says a provincial approach creates inequity between candidates and limits them to practice only within their province. What we really feel we need is to get the colleges together to implement a broader solution. In BC, the college has joined with UBC to offer clinical exams. Bennett finally took his this weekend after almost a year and a half. But this is just an interim step while the college figures out its next moves, which could include changes to the bylaws. Bylaw amendments are not a simple process. Colleges must apply to the Ministry of Health, a lengthy exercise that is subject to a three-month notification period. Which means the careers of recent physio graduates continue to linger in limbo. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. BC has now changed the rules when it comes to issuing identification for trans, non-binary and gender diverse people in this province. Each person knows their own gender best. We need to hear from people about who they are, and that is all the confirmation as government that we need to treat people with respect and dignity. Speak anyone looking to update their gender on their ID no longer need confirmation from a medical professional. This change applies to the BC Services Card, driver's licenses, and birth certificates. Still, people under the age of 19 will need to show proof of support from a parent or guardian. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. Joe, before we get to the weather forecast, we need to talk about a fascinating story from Vancouver mm -hmm. Island. This photographer thought she spotted an iceberg. What happened? It's true, and I'm here to tell you, Dan, floating icebergs in the Salish Sea are not likely, but that's exactly what it looks like. Let me show you this incredible imagery uh, just off the coast of uh, Nanaimo, and you can see what clearly looks like an iceberg, a perfectly formed tubular massive iceberg not expected in this part of the world. Uh, this is what we call a superior mirage. And I don't know if I would have known it was one uh, until uh, looking into the details. This uh, kind of phenomenon can happen when you get an inversion. So what you're looking at over on the right-hand side of the screen is actually Mount Baker. So we do get mountain views, but the refraction that we're seeing in the water is actually the top of Mount Chiam, just north of Chilliwack, 180 kilometers per, uh, away. So when we get warm air on top of cold air, uh, we get that image inverted, and it can be directed far, far away in this case. I've never seen anything like it. Take a listen to the photographer, though, though describe the moment. I thought I got to take pictures of this. This is incredible. I cannot believe what, what I'm seeing. Um, and it looked so convincing and so real because the outline was very crisp and clear, and there were shadows there as well, which made it look three-dimensional, really. So I've seen versions of ships floating on the horizon, but again, nothing like this. Uh, take a listen to a UVic uh, astrophysicist, though, or atmospheric scientist, I should say, on the uh, likelihood. Always excited about 
people being outside and observing cool things in nature. It turns out that mirages are quite common over the Salish Sea. And there's two types. There's this superior mirage that we've seen recently, but we also see inferior mirages where we see things get flipped upside down. So very cool phenomenon. Look out and next time you're out on the waters and we've got a decent forecast. I wouldn't say it's mirage weather, but some sunny breaks in the long range, Dan, and some milder temperatures too. Uh, nice that we've got some benign weather as we head into the long weekend or uh, a weekend. Uh, not long. You know where my head's at. Those six at uh, YVR right now will remain above season and I'll take you through a chance of showers overnight and a chance of sunny breaks in, uh, in a little bit later on in the show, Dan. That sounds good. Thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. Healthcare workers in our hospitals are finishing up yet another busy week with COVID-19 cases going up, particularly as Omicron spreads. One of those workers is Dr. Michael Curry, an emergency room physician and clinical associate professor at UBC. Dr. Curry, first of all, uh, what's this week been like for you? It's been an extremely busy week. With the bad weather here in Vancouver, we had an unprecedented number of slip and falls and people coming in with broken things. And then we've been having an avalanche of patients coming in with COVID symptoms, mostly the Omicron variant. What are you seeing in terms of, of the severity of those symptoms? So in general, we're seeing a lot of COVID infections, but between the inherent nature of the Omicron virus probably being a bit milder than other variants, and because of the high rate of vaccination, generally they're pretty mild symptoms for the most part, but we are getting a large number of patients and a small percentage of them are very sick. And what about how this wave differs from the last? Is it just the volume of patients uh, that, that is so different? I think it's uh, two main factors. So the volume is higher than I've seen ever before in British Columbia, but also the severity is much less. We're getting closer to what we would expect with a bad influenza season. The other distinction is we're generally seeing younger people. When COVID first started, the sick people who were coming to hospital were the elderly people in long-term care facilities and the immunocompromised. Now we're seeing largely younger and more social people coming in with the Omicron variant infection. And if you don't have a, 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 a firm number, can you tell us anecdotally of those younger people, the patients you're seeing with COVID, how many are vaccinated, how many are unvaccinated? So fortunately, I've worked in a community with one of British Columbia's highest vaccination rates. So it is largely people who are unvaccinated. Uh, it's largely people who are vaccinated that are coming in. However, among the sick people that require hospital admission, we're probably looking at about 70% being unvaccinated. Do you have any sense of where we are in terms of this wave of COVID with Omicron peaking. We've heard Dr. Henry say it may last a few more weeks. What's your sense of it based on uh, uh, being in the front line? So I think there is probably, we're probably around the peak right now. I think that's driven by two things. Once it goes around the community, people develop resistance to the infection and can't get infected again, or at least a lot less likely to get infected again. The other thing is the holiday season, there's a lot of traveling, a lot of socializing, and a lot of spread of respiratory viruses. And we see this every year with a bit of a surge in January after the holiday season. And we're seeing it again this year. And I hope we're at, or at least very close to the peak. And lastly, doctor, uh, how are you and the other healthcare workers handling this? We know there've been concerns about uh, staff having to come in, even if they have been infected with COVID or ill, what's that been like? Uh, I think it's been a really challenging time at hospitals uh, throughout the region and particular branches of the healthcare system, such as intensive care units and the emergency department. I think you're seeing the brunt of it. But by and large, with this going on for over two years, there's a lot of healthcare worker burnout and there is a general shortage of physicians, nurses, and other healthcare workers. So it has been really challenging for those of us working through this. Mm -hmm. Dr. Michael Curry, we appreciate your time and your expertise. All the best. Thank you very much. An apology to Her Majesty, while the UK Prime Minister is yet again backpedaling, and why some say this latest misstep may signal the end of his tenure. Next.
Thank you for staying with us on our commercial-free live stream tonight. Hello to everyone watching. A Saskatoon woman wanted to bring some color and joy to her neighborhood, so she decided to create an ice wall. And what started out small gradually grew, and it brought people together. Take a look. I am building an ice wall, and which is um, morphing into an, a fort. So it started off with the idea of just building a few bricks, making a small wall in front of my house to bring some joy to the neighborhood. Well, I started it, I think, on the coldest day, right after Christmas. So it was about minus 45 when I started making the bricks and uh, started laying the first bricks on the 31st of December. And so I'm still working on it. It did take longer than I thought because originally it was just going to be a small project, but as I started working on it and was enjoying it and more ideas were coming and so it is probably going to be an ongoing project. I imagine working on it for the rest of the winter. I've learned that it is much easier to build when it's minus 40 than when it's minus 5, that things freeze much quicker. So I went to Dollarama and I got a whole bunch of mini um, loaf tins, 60 of them. I'd come out first thing in the morning with jugs of colored water and pour them into the loaf tins, let them freeze. When it was minus 40, they were frozen in three hours so I could do mass production. I mean, the most fun was talking to the people as they were walking by or stopping by. I've had more contact with people in the last week and a half than I think I have the last two years. So it's just been really fun to have people stop and talk about the wall and why I was doing it and asking me questions about how they could do it for themselves. The British Prime Minister's office is apologizing again because of another party during lockdown. This time, there were actually two soirees. And as Margaret Evans tells us, this apology is to the Queen. Another day, another Downing Street party to apologize for. This time, two of them, and both on the eve of Prince Philip's funeral last spring, with drinking and dancing late into the night. The image of the Queen sitting alone at the funeral respecting the COVID rules of the day offers up a sharp contrast to the conduct of the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his circle, accused of repeatedly flouting the same rule. The Prime Minister didn't attend that night, but analysts say that won't help him. If uh, the staff were uh, partying, one would expect that that had something to do with the fact that they didn't think it would be any problem with the boss. The Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, was dispatched to defend Johnson. The Prime Minister apologised on Wednesday. He was very clear that mistakes have been made. That apology was for attending a Downing Street Bring Your Own Booze Garden Party in 2020. It hasn't mollified many. The apology was half-hearted. It even seemed to intimate that, in his mind, he seemed to believe that perhaps the rules 
were not broken. This is just very, very, um, um, what I would say, shameful. Downing Street's strategy up to now has been to refer critics to a pending investigation by a senior civil servant appointed by Boris Johnson. Critics cry foul, saying the Prime Minister should recuse himself from oversight of any inquiry. Its findings, in the absence of any further revelations, is the next step in this story. But it doesn't necessarily signal an end to it. Boris Johnson's clearly in serious trouble. I guess the question is whether the trouble is uh, fatal or not. It will depend on whether Conservative MPs decide to back Johnson or trigger a leadership challenge. That's why it's too soon to tell whether these are indeed the end days of Boris Johnson's premiership. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Back in this country, the newest modeling by Canada's public health agency suggests the Omicron variant will push hospital admissions to extremely high levels. It says it expects several weeks of very intense activity. But as CBC's Hannah Thibodeau shows us, health officials are hopeful the peak will come soon. When it comes to the number of COVID-19 cases across the country, it was a bad news, good news scenario from federal public health officials. First, the bad news. In just a few short weeks, Omicron has spread faster and further than any previous variant. Look at this graph. The red line is COVID activity. The sharp peak at the end is where the Omicron variant takes hold. It's significantly eclipsing all previous waves of the pandemic. While Omicron is less severe than past variants, the sheer number of new infections means more people will potentially have a severe outcome, including hospitalization and death. Since December, the number of people with COVID-19 in hospitals has more than quadrupled. I guess the bottom line is this variant is having a very significant impact on the hospitalizations. But the other thing that's very different is that, of course, staff are getting sick at the same time. So that is putting a lot of pressure on the hospital systems. So here is the good news. There are early indications that the rate of new infections may be stabilizing in Ontario and Quebec. Experts tell us that we have a new case, that uh, the new cases has peaked. Uh, the wave of hospitalization is expected to peak in the next coming days. Other provinces have hit the peak. So we think that we hit the peak of community transmission in British Columbia probably this past weekend. That's important. Important, but health officials do caution while the number of cases may start to go down, hospitalization numbers do lag behind. Being at the peak of a mountain still means you're very high up. So it's still going to be a while before case counts really start to fall and it will be longer still until the hospitals really start to empty out. To prevent further strain on hospitals, health officials are calling on those who are not fully vaccinated to get a dose or get a booster because more than 6.5 million Canadians are still not fully vaccinated. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Many Canadians have signed questionable contracts for furnaces, hot water tanks, air conditioners and more equipment they don't want or need. Go Public and Marketplace have launched an investigation putting hidden cameras in a house to uncover the tactics behind the pitch that's tricking homeowners into signing. Rosa Marcatelli has more on what they found. Nice to meet you. I'm you out today. A marketplace producer poses as a homeowner, looking to get a free assessment from a company called Ontario Green Savings. It's a name that keeps coming up in the dozens of complaints to Consumer Protection Ontario, Marketplace and Go Public. 2011, 10 years old, it's still on the rental. Salesperson and manager Axel Hermosa tells us the hot water tank has to be replaced ASAP because it's almost 10 years old. And insurance, he says, won't cover damage caused by a tank older than that. You have to get it replaced within the next six days. We check later, that's not true. He also tells us the tank could suddenly burst. And just be careful, don't like get too drunk and like bump into the tank, like they're fragile once they get old. But we had an HVAC expert check the equipment. There's nothing wrong with it. There nothing needs to be replaced. Lawyer Dennis Crawford has dozens of clients who are fighting these contracts with many different HVAC rental companies. And I've seen them do it over and over again. 
They tell homeowners, your equipment needs to be replaced. You don't have any other choice. Homeowners like Karen Norgard, who's stuck with a contract that has her paying more than $12,000 for a furnace worth about $1,800 or about $2,700 with installation. I've been horribly scammed. Ontario Green Savings won't talk to us, referring us to its lawyer, who would only say he's been advised the allegations are unfounded. Hello, Rosa speaking. Uh, hi, Rosa. Uh, this is Axel calling. You left me a message. You may call me a few times. We do reach salesperson Axel Hermosa, asking if he'll talk to us on camera. 2,500 reviews that are available on Google and seen the positive reviews from my name there. Is that what you're mentioning? Or are you speaking about maybe a couple unhappy customers? No, we absolutely want to put it all to you. That interview never happens. The Ontario government has been reviewing the Consumer Protection Act for two years now. It says it's considering all feedback. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. More of the slick sales tactics as insiders reveal the tricks used to get inside your homes and around consumer protection laws. That's on Marketplace on CBC Television tonight at 8 and streaming on CBC Gen. Back to school in BC, so how was that first week? We talked the return to the classroom amid the Omicron outbreak with two students. Stick around for this. By next summer, the demand for these bears could be at a premium. It's the result of the trophy hunting ban in B.C., and it has people worried. Still, at least one of the territory's 19 outfitters says the grizzly population will be fine. The Yukon grizzly bear hunt is, uh, is very closely monitored by the department, and, um, and although non-resident hunters take most of the grizzly bears that are shot, uh, every outfitter is under a quota. He's under a point system, it's called. And, uh, and that is very rigidly enforced. But what is the total population? The Yukon government estimates it's between six and 7,000 grizzlies. But it admits that's only a guess. How, how can we really be sure how many there are? It's, it's, it's a very good question, and it's one that all management agencies, I think, in North America or, or in Western Canada, for sure, are, are grappling with right now. As I explained before, they are, they are a very difficult animal to uh, get an estimate on or to get a count on. So, 56 grizzlies were killed in the Yukon last summer by visiting hunters, most of them European. Larson says he suspects that number will rise because of the ban in British Columbia but he says the territory won't allow more than 2% of the grizzly population to be harvested. 2% is a number that Yukon environmentalists can live with. Their best estimates put the population of grizzlies in the Yukon at a third of Canada's total. That's a number they'd like to see maintained well into the future. Scott Regeer, CBC News, Whitehorse. Bennett's dream involves this two-kilometer stretch of downtown Vancouver waterfront. He's negotiating to buy it from the CPR. He wants it redeveloped as a national showplace. At one end would be the $100 million amphitheater that's soon to be built as the new home for professional sport on the West Coast. Buildings needed for an international transportation exhibition that Vancouver wants to host in 1986 will occupy much of the rest of the site. Bennett envisions here an experimental rapid transit system and a permanent display of Canadian enterprise that he's dubbed the Avenue of the Provinces. Bennett unveiled his vision today minus a price tag, but made it clear that he wants and expects federal help. But I would expect that uh, British Columbia and Vancouver would receive exactly the same uh, treatment as Montreal did in, in their exciting international exposition in, in, in 1967. The mid-campaign timing of Bennett's scheme is tantamount to an invitation for passing federal politicians to drop their contributions in the B.C. hat. Leading Liberals moved in quickly today with promises of support. New Democrats seem to want more details before committing themselves. Tories were publicly expressing doubts as to whether Bill Bennett's vision really qualified as a national dream. Colin Holt, CBC News, Vancouver.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight for you on CBC Vancouver News. We've been delivering a sofa between three and five weeks for 43 years. And this last year, we went from three to five week delivery to six month delivery. It's going to cost you more and take longer to flop down onto a new couch or love seat. From big box stores to smaller BC shops, furniture makers are being hit hard by higher material costs and supply chain issues. That means higher prices for you. Way too close to home. Vancouver police are warning you about a new scam that shows up at your door. A scammer says, the force says scammers trick people into believing their loved ones are in jail and need money, lots of it, to pay for legal costs. Then a person arrives at the door to collect thousands of dollars in cash. Police say several people have already been swindled. I do think this is a real transition in our um, moving out of the pandemic and learning to live with this virus. NBC's latest COVID modeling has some good news and cautious news. Health officials say the latest data shows the pandemic wave fueled by Omicron may have peaked in parts of our province, but more people are likely to end up in hospital in the next week or two. Dr. Bonnie Henry says that is due to a lag time between peak transmission in the community and peak hospitalizations. Well, today wraps up the first week back for most school children following the winter break in BC, and there's plenty of debate still about safety measures. Return to school was delayed by a week to buy time for the province to enhance COVID protocols in schools. That includes staggered break times, virtual assemblies, and visitor restrictions. But the transmissibility of Omicron still has many people worried. The BC Teachers Federation is again calling for N95 masks, better ventilation, and vaccine clinics in schools. There are also questions about making rapid tests more widely available. All this busy week, parents and teachers have been sounding off about enhanced back-to-school COVID-19 measures. But how are students feeling? Well, we have two with us now to give us a better sense of it all and what's it been like. Olive Cove is 13 and in grade 8 at Windermere Secondary in Vancouver. And Elise Gezer is 12 and in grade 7 at Selkirk Elementary, also in Vancouver. Welcome to you both. Uh, Olive, I'll start with you. It's been a week since you both went back to class. What has your first week been like? Um, yeah, my first week back at school has been, it's been pretty normal just with the extra precautions at my school. So the desks are more spread out and the teachers are making sure we have our masks on at all times. But other than that, it's been pretty okay. Right. And Elise, how about your first week? What's it been like? Pretty similar to all of our desks are spaced out. Now the teachers are encouraging that we wear two masks and there is a lot more hand sanitizer in our classroom. And what's it like being back, I guess, in class? Do you prefer to be in class with your schoolmates or, or any sense that you'd rather stay home still? Um, I really like being in school. Online learning is fun for about a week, but then you get really bored and you realize that you can't see any of your friends except for on a computer. Yeah. Aldo, for you, how are, how are some of your classmates feeling about uh, this first week? Um, yeah, I know that some of my classmates are a bit, it's a bit nerve wracking, you know, with COVID and everything being around so many people, especially in PE class when people don't always wear masks. But um, me personally, I'm feeling good. And for your teachers and, <laughs> pardon me, and others, uh, do you have a, uh, any idea how many of your teachers or classmates have been, have been sick and had to be away and what that's like? Uh, Elise, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, actually, my teacher got sick and hasn't come this week. So that was kind of funny. We had a sub all week and two people in my class aren't there. But we had like three different subs throughout the week. So we were learning new things, but it wasn't the same person explaining it. So that was a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And for the people in my class, I guess whatever's good for them. But it was a bit weird not having them um, really close yeah. in my class. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I paused there. And, and all of, uh, are most people at school pretty good about wearing the masks and taking those extra precautions? Yeah, yeah, most people are, but some people prefer to have it off because of more, you know, air circulation, but a lot of most people keep their masks on. And lastly, for both of you, Elise, I'll start with you. What do you hope that uh, you might change or, or that uh, will become better as the year goes ahead? Um, I'm really hoping that our desks can become closer together. A lot of people are really spaced out in my classroom. 
and it's kind of difficult to hear people. So that would be really helpful. And Olive, how about you? Yeah, same um, with me. I hope that we get to be closer together. And also we have these blocks where we usually get to go to whatever class we want. But because of COVID, we've had to stay in the same class. So I'm hoping that that returns back to normal soon. Mm. It's not easy. Uh, all of Cove, Elise Gazier, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Yeah, no Thank problem. you. A 17-year-old Surrey photographer has had her work featured in a prestigious Canadian nature calendar. Her inspiration and why she loves shooting birds with a camera. Next. And at 644, a live look at Cypress Mountain tonight. Back open after some time closed because of weather and Omicron impacting staff. A little more icy up there, though. But is there fresh powder ahead this weekend? Johanna Wagstaff will tell us in the BC-wide forecast. A little bit of pro tip, and I don't know, Nick, whether you know this. Add just a smidgen of baking soda, it will cut down that cooking time. I would probably say by threefold. Baking soda adds alkalinity. By adjusting the pH balance, the Maillard reaction will speed up too. So Lisa even adds a pinch of baking soda to turn a turkey crispy golden brown. Having a better understanding of the science behind the food and the methods that you use in cooking makes you cook smarter. Look at that, that's crazy, it actually works. The onions with baking soda are softer and browner. Science for the win. This next story is for the birds. A Surrey teenager's photographs have been published in the Canadian Geographic Calendar. Caitlin McDonald is a student at Earl Marriott Secondary, and now her work will be seen across this large country. She joins us now. Caitlin, first of all, congratulations. How did you get chosen for this? 
Thank you. Um, I first got in touch with Canadian Geographic when I entered one of my photos for their photo competition. Um, and that ended up winning um, youth honorable mentions in 2018, which was really nice. And so I kept entering my photos to their competitions and I believe that's how they got my hummingbird one. So when you found out that you were gonna be in the calendar, what, what went through your mind? Oh, I was so excited. It's a really unique experience for me just cause I have never really seen myself in print before, let alone in Canadian Geographic. And I used to like read Canadian Geographic when I was younger. So it was a really amazing opportunity. I like jumped around a bit. It was quite exciting. Now, for people who aren't familiar with where you, you, you captured most of these photographs, where was it? Oh, um, it was at the George Rifle Migratory Bird Sanctuary. It's around Ladner. And, and now beyond the calendar, how else is your work being, being featured? Um, I also am in one of their magazines. Um, it's a special edition, um, Best Wildlife 2021. I have a spread in there as, along with a Q&A, which is really nice. Now, for anybody who's seen the photographs and we're, we're showing them, uh, awesome work. They're, they're, they're stunning. What, what made you get into photography? Um, I, honestly, I just really love wildlife and I love documenting moments of my life. So just to blend those two together is really nice. I went to um, the bird saint trail a lot with my family when I was younger and just went on walks and I eventually started bringing along a camera and just taking photos. So that's what really got me into it. Now, a whole variety of animals and, and birds that you photograph. Do you have a favorite? Um, yes, I would say it's the great, um, great blue heron. I really love those birds. They're so beautiful. Especially the, when they're on the water. Oh, sorry. That's all right. And, and what are the challenges of, of photographing something like that and then photographing something like um, either the wood duck or uh, the owl or the, the hummingbird? Um, I'd say probably patience for all of them is a really important thing. Um, the hummingbirds, um, they're pretty fast, so I have to be like really alert with it. Um, and the great blue herons, they're more slow or not because they just like to stay in one place, but it's still, I have to be very patient to wait for the right moment to, and the right lighting. Yeah. Now beyond this, where do you hope this, uh, this uh, your photography takes you? Um, that's a good question. Honestly, I'm not too sure. I hope eventually maybe I'll do it as a career path, but right now I'm sort of just living in the moment and just taking it for enjoyment right now. Well, you certainly have a talent for it. Caitlin McDonald, thank you for sharing uh, your talent with us. Thank you, I really appreciate it, thank you. Time for our full provincial weather forecast with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Joe, before we begin, amazing photographs from Caitlin. My favorite was the owl. Yeah, just stunning. I thought for some reason I thought you would like the owl. Mm. Yeah, I've got to go with. Because uh, I've got to go with the. Yeah. yeah the, I don't know why the turtleneck. It just. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Owls and turtlenecks. Now there's a yeah. photography session everyone wants. Except when you have to put the turtleneck <laughs> on the owl. I'm gonna go to Caitlin for advice on this one. <laughs> Smart. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. Well, you know what, Dan? I've got uh, some decent forecast forecast for this weekend for anyone thinking to head out and try their hand at uh, photography. We actually have some study breaks coming up uh, both Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. Let me start you off with a big picture. First, we have to get through some approaching showers moving across the island right now. That's going to fill in for Metro Vancouver after the midnight hour. It's a little trough, not quite uh, a hardcore cold front. In fact, temperatures won't drop too much. Just starting to see those showers show up in Nanaimo. Uh, heads up across the south coast in the next couple of hours. Whoa, getting you to the other side of the country for a moment because I'm tracking another major storm for our friends on the east coast. It's just getting started tonight, so I wanted to show you the live radar. Uh, parts of PEI in New Brunswick going to end up with 45 centimeters of snow on the ground tomorrow morning. Uh, we know snow, so it's nice to have a bit of a break, even if uh, people are getting hit on the other side of the country. Three and through Kelowna tomorrow free up towards Prince George. Temperatures are still quite mild across the interior, above seasonal uh, compared to our last 30 year average anyway. Uh, Cranbrook looking at a two. Now uh, I've got the sunny icon for most uh, stations in the interior, but watch for freezing rain in the morning for places like Cranbrook, uh, some wet snow in through Kelowna before we think, see things clear out and uh, dry up and warm up. Threes 
uh, well above seasonal, as I mentioned. I think highs are around minus six for this time of the year in Kelowna. So there's that spinning low off the coast. The uh, little trough really loses its punch. We'll see some uh, snow for Highway 3 and through the uh, uh, southeast mountain passes. Otherwise, quiet looking weekend. So possibly some sunny breaks Saturday afternoon. I've got the mainly cloudy icon for Sunday. Uh, some models are showing things to break up. So I would uh, expect a mainly cloudy weekend. And when you see those sunny breaks, be delighted because Dan, for <laughs> sure, Monday through Thursday, things get wet. Johanna's orders. Enjoy the sun. She means it. Yep, I do. Uh, thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. A seven-year-old in Germany has a unique stand-in at school. He can't attend right now, so a robot is going in his place. How it's keeping him in touch with his classmates and teachers. Next. When Rusty Bitterman and his wife decided to bring a couple of cows to their property at Rusterette Farm, they had no idea what that journey would become. They wanted something small to produce milk for themselves. They set their sights on a carry cow. All the things we were looking for in a cow seemed to be in, in the carry and the right scale for, for a small place like this. Kerry cows are a rare heritage breed of dairy cattle. They're a bit smaller than your average dairy cow like a Holstein. Kerry's weigh about 800 to 1,000 pounds. A Holstein weighs about 12 to 1,500 pounds. Kerry's are known for their black hair and horns. Holsteins are usually black and white. And Kerry's can thrive in small pastures. And Holsteins need a bigger space to roam. But when it came to actually finding a carry, Bitterman was out of luck. He called farms across the country, but no one had a carry to sell. That's when he realized it was because there aren't many of them left, less than 100 breeding females in all of North America. He came to realize that if people didn't act to protect the breed, it wasn't going to be there. It's, it's gone from looking, <laughs> looking at a cow that would serve our needs to realizing that we probably should step up and play a role in, in doing something bigger. Then his luck changed when a farm in Alberta sent a couple carries to his farm. In 2015, he got a carry bull from a breeder in the U.S. She's been working for years to increase numbers in the States and is happy to see farms like Bitterman's taking up the cause here. We need these little, these little mom and pop farms that just want a homestead or they just want, you know, they just want a few cows to offer to their, their community, and that's what's going to save the heritage breeds. The most recent additions, though, Abby and Alice. The cows were in Saskatchewan and needed a new home because of the drought conditions there. So they made the long journey across the country to their new home here on PEI. Bitterman's herd now has eight breeding females and three bulls. Moving forward, he says he may explore things like embryo transplants to help boost numbers and genetic diversity in other parts of the country. It's the heritage of, of not just centuries, but millennia that would be gone forever. And it just seems to us unconscionable uh, to let that happen on our watch. But for now, he's going to let his cows enjoy their new pasture, happy to know he's doing his part to secure a future for carries on PEI and around the world. Brittany Spencer, CBC News, Shamrock. In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. A seven-year-old German boy who cannot attend school right now because he's sick is still a big presence in his classroom. He interacts with his teacher and classmates through an avatar robot. 
Ich will nicht, dass die Schule explodiert. Joshi uses the robot to send a blinking signal when he has something to say. The mini machine has turned out to be a big hit. Classmates use it to communicate, even share a few laughs. Joshi can't attend classes in person because of a severe lung disease. The school district put four avatars into classrooms in response to COVID-19, but officials say this could last well beyond the end of the pandemic. Cool. Thanks for joining us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can always watch our show on CBC Gym, the free app. We're also on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Your next local news is at 11 o'clock tonight, right after the National with Isabel Regam. We're going to leave you with pictures from the capital, where the Rideau Canal in Ottawa has opened up for skaters from one end to another. Eight kilometers long. Enjoy. Stay safe this weekend.